I'd now like to welcome and introduce our next keynote speaker. He's an international keynote speaker, uh, Professor Michael Chandler, and he has travelled all the way from British Columbia, Columbia, Canada, to be our conference today. Professor Chandler is an internationally recognised deve developmental psychologist in the field of Indigenous social and emotional wellbeing and suicide prevention in Indigenous communities. He works at the University of British Columbia, an ongoing program of research that explores the role that culture plays in setting the course of identifying developmental. He is recognised for his contribution to health research and has been widely recognised for improvements in Aboriginal health outcomes and reducing rates of suicide in Aboriginal communities through recognising the importance of cultural identity. Today he will address you on the cultural wounds required, cultural medicines, how cultural continually reduces suicide. I welcome and present Professor Michael Chandler. So good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I want to begin by um, thanking first the officers and uh, staff of Snake, if, if it's okay to say that. Um, and they've been remarkably helpful and generous to me. And uh, so I want, uh, I, I want to publicly reflect that fact and thank them, thank them all. Um, I also, as we do in Canada, want to express my appreciation uh, to the traditional owners of this land uh, for the opportunity to speak here. Now, as you've heard, the, the talk, the short talk that I'll give here today, um, is first titled, Cultural Wounds Require Cultural Medicine. And I mean to, um, if I know how to make this work, um, uh, begin by uh, previewing for you um, what will turn out to be four or five points uh, that uh, I'll organize this talk around. Um, the first really isn't a point. Um, it's um, in the way that I guess is um, thought to be common among Canadians. I have to begin by telling you that I'm sorry. And um, I'm sorry in this particular case about two things. One is that I'm sitting down. And um, I'm not sure whose fault that is. Um, but um, I find it disrespectful. And so I apologize to you um, uh, for the fact that standing up here for 45 minutes uh, is not within my range of uh, competence any longer. Um, and the second is that um, I'll be talking primarily about uh, research that was done in Canada. And um, uh, the First Nations uh, people of Canada are not um, uh, co-equal or co-extensive with uh, Australian Aboriginal people. Um, in fact, they're not even, that is the Canadian First Nations people were not even similar to themselves. Um, there are more than 500 what we call bands, tribes perhaps, um, and they speak um, over 50 different indigenous languages. And uh, to march across um, Canada, east to west, uh, you encounter radically different groups of people with importantly different uh, belief systems, uh, customs, practices. And um, 
uh, also uh, differences in the degree to which they're subject to various um, illnesses and, and, and troubles, many of which are, I think, only understandable uh, when seen through a lens that um, uh, allows us to understand those problems and the illnesses um, as uh, manifestations of, of uh, cultural abuse. Um, so um, I want to then uh, um, go on here to something is not well maybe I can <clears throat> okay so um, so if that's my um, first point my second point will be to the real point will be to talk to you about uh, a concept uh, which I call um, cultural continuity and personal continuity. And um, I, um, I get into all of that uh, because um, suicide in the last analysis happens to individual people. There is a dead body on the ground. Um, but our way of understanding that, I think our best available way of understanding it, is to understand it as a manifestation of cultural abuse. And so we have to find some kind of conceptual framework that allows us to move back and forth between talking about um, suicidal individuals and the cultures which sponsor um, the difficulties that they're having. Um, so, um, in a moment, I'll talk about uh, this concept of cultural continuity uh, in, in some greater detail. Um, my third point, uh, I, I want to illustrate for you um, what I've discovered in my um, research over what's some 20 years now. Um, about the um, about the variability in um, suicide rates um, as they occur in Canada across um, across the, the, the whole of my province, which is British Columbia, and um, so uh, you uh, as as I'll spell out for you in detail. Um, many of these communities have no suicides, whereas others have um, youth suicide rates hundreds of times the national average. So uh, we need to talk together and uh, think about how, uh, what could contribute to the fact that um, suicide is not uh, somehow uniformly distributed across all of the 200 bands that live in my province. And so much of my research efforts have been to try to run that to earth. And um, so, um, uh, but at first I'll, I'll, I'll try to document for you just how variable suicide is when uh, looked at community by community. Uh, fourth, I want to uh, report on a series of studies um, that um, uh, search to try to search for an answer to the question of why is it that these communities differ so dramatically one from the other in terms of their suicide rate. And so that work largely fits under the rubric of um, discussions of the social determinants of suicide. And then finally, um, um, I, I want to uh, reflect on the implications of this work uh, for the possible, possible suicide prevention in the future. So that's my agenda, uh, my working agenda, and I mean to try to march my way through it uh, in 
I, I have a clock that's supposed to be counting down the minutes I have left, but it's not doing it. So uh, I'll have to ask for others to help me keep track of my time. Um, so um, let me save then uh, a, a few quick moments about this concept of cultural continuity as a protective factor uh, against suicide in Canadian First Nations youth. Um, uh, first of all, um, um, in ways that uh, are remarkably similar to uh, the circumstances here in Australia, um, uh, it turns out that, um, um, that uh, non-Indigenous people have suicide rates uh, that by comparison with their indigenous counterparts are quite low and that, um, and I'm telling you something that probably everyone in the room is aware of, uh, at least as it applies to, um, to Australia, that indigenous people uh, have suicide rates that are somewhere between three and five times higher than is true for the general population. Um, if you compare not just all indigenous people, but indigenous youth, then the difference between uh, the ordinary population uh, of Australia or Canada and uh, the indigenous members of those countries, then uh, the difference is even more dramatic and uh, the, uh, the, there's a pileup in the uh, suicide rates for indigenous youth. Um, I'll do this very quickly. It, it just says in my province that um, um, something like 3% of the population is indigenous, um, yet, um, something like almost 10% of the suicides are suicides of indigenous people. And if you, again, uh, contrast indigenous people who are youthful uh, or not, um, then uh, again, it's true that 25% of the um, suicides in the indigenous world um, are young indigenous people and that of all the suicides that occur uh, in the indigenous world, more than half are the, involve the deaths of uh, young people. And um, so I think that's pretty much common understanding here in Australia, and it's true in many other uh, parts of the world uh, where there are other indigenous people the, the Sami of uh, uh, the far north of Norway and Sweden, um, the Hawaiian and, uh, islands, the, um, and uh, in, in effect, every place that research has taken place, you, you end up with a picture not unlike the one that's in front of you right now. Um, but what I, what I want to stress is that all of these figures um, are lies. Uh, they're damn lies and they're um, hurtful uh, statistics um, that I think um, seriously impair uh, our ability to try to understand suicide in the indigenous world. And so uh, I want to call these numbers actuarial fictions. Um, if, if I were uh, running a government, um, I would anticipate being asked, well, what is the suicide rate in your country? Uh, what's the suicide rate of indigenous people in your country? And I better have an answer uh, to a question like that. And so Canada's answer is, four or five times higher for the indigenous people. And it's about the same, um, roughly, here in Australia. 
Um, now, there's a, a map of Canada in, in whitish colors, and over on uh, my left uh, is a map of British Columbia. It's um, a thousand miles tall and 500 miles wide, uh, bigger than Texas, uh, although here in Australia, all that may not seem very big, but it, but it certainly is big enough. Um, um, so there's that same map again, and I, here I transpose it onto uh, Western Europe. And what you're meant to see and take note of is that um, um, that chunk of Western Europe, maybe 14 countries, uh, if you told people uh, from those places, Belgium or Germany or France, that they're all co-equal um, and can be, can be usefully lumped together, uh, you'd be laughed out of town. Uh, they simply wouldn't buy the idea that uh, there is some homogenized culture uh, afoot there. And it, it would be just as serious a mistake to imagine that you can look at some place like the province of British Columbia and uh, also imagine that the 200 uh, indigenous First Nations bands there are uh, equivalent uh, in terms of the conditions that support suicide and the actual rate of suicide of indigenous people in that chunk of the world. Now, so uh, what can happen and, and does happen is that uh, you take the number from British Columbia and you uh, uh, disaggregate it. You find ways of chopping it up until you get smaller units. Uh, one way of doing that is look at uh, BC census figures. And this, uh, this slide simply shows in red uh, and blue the fact that if you're non-indigenous, it really doesn't make any serious difference which census district you're from. But there are radical and dramatic sawtooth differences that uh, separate um, um, the indigenous people who happen to live in those different artificially created uh, boundaries conditions. Um, the statistical wizards among you will take note of the fact that it isn't part of that due to the fact that the number of people living in each of these two, 200 indigenous communities is, tends to be small. Uh, 500 is a big community. Uh, and that some of this radical variation from place to place is, the, uh, art, is an artifact of, um, of these small numbers. And part of that's true, but I'll, I'll try to show you in a few moments um, why it doesn't cover the whole waterfront of explanation. Um, here's another way of chopping it up, disaggregating it. Uh, there are, what is it, um, 20 health regions. And you could ask, what's the indigenous suicide rate uh, in each of the province's 20 health districts? And you'd get the picture, again, that um, uh, you see here uh, on the board. Uh, and the picture is common. Um, uh, that it's, it's sawtoothed. But in a sense, that makes no sense uh, because somebody just drew some lines that divided up the province into census districts or health districts. What, before this can start to make any sort of cultural sense, uh, you need to disaggregate um, uh, along cultural lines. One way of doing this is simply looking at the suicide rate of each of the 200 bands in British Columbia. Uh, that doesn't look great. There. Now, what you see there is that if you look band by band across the, 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 the province, um, a whole bunch of uh, communities touch baseline. That is, they have no suicides. 
or very few suicides. And others have rates, startling rates, uh, more than 3,000 times the national average. Okay, so uh, this is in a culturally coherent, maybe that's too strong, uh, in a culturally meaningful way, uh, a way of looking at uh, differential suicide rates uh, by individual um, indigenous communities. Um, this really shows the same information in a different way, um, particularly what you're meant to uh, be attentive to is the fact that almost half of the 200 bands have not had a suicide in the 20 years that I've been studying them. And th that's quite remarkable, and it's lower than the suicide rate for the general population. And then it mounts in the, in the communities that have serious uh, suicide problems until you get uh, extravagantly high suicide rates. Um, this again is, um, partially the same evidence, but uh, in, in Canada, uh, different bands are amalgamated into what we call tribal councils. And typically there are a dozen or 15 bands who are part of a common uh, council. And if you, um, if you arrange the evidence um, by council rather than by individual band, you partially deal with the low end problem, that is, uh, the number of people under consideration is much higher. Uh, uh, in, in looking at the collection of everyone who is um, uh, a part of, um, uh, everyone who's a part of that band council. Does that make sense? Um, I, I, I just mean to stress the point that, um, uh, when you're aggregating and disaggregating, you can do so at a variety of levels. And uh, optimally, uh, you get to some point where the, the findings that emerge make cultural sense. Um, and at least in this case, it works at the level of both tribal councils and individual bands. Now, um, what, what the evidence that I've just shown you, um, uh, the question that it speaks to is the notion of whether, there, whether the indigens, that is all the indigenous groups in some place, uh, create a kind of a monolith, that is they can all be counted as being equal or co, uh, co coextensive with one another, um, this is how you would get to something like a national claim about the national suicide rate. Um, so um, I think that the evidence in hand uh, that shows the dramatic difference between um, in a province with 200 communities, bands, half of them have never had a suicide. And um, I'll come back to that point later because I think um, hidden, not particularly well hidden, uh, in, that, in those findings is an important clue about how we might best approach the problem of suicide prevention. Um, so, um, And by contrast, uh, I guess um, it's important to appreciate that um, uh, living by these um, uh, misleading actuarial fictions um, creates an enormous uh, squandering of money and human resources. That is, if half the, half the communities in British Columbia don't have a suicide problem, then it's uh, not very wise to um, uh, allocate what little money is allocated to try to solve this problem equally to every community. 
what you end up doing is short sheeting the communities that have dramatically high rates uh, and giving for no particularly good reason uh, suicide prevention funds to communities that don't have a suicide problem. So uh, there are, I think, uh, important policy implications as well that follow from the relatively simple job of uh, just disaggregating, uh, looking in, the, I think, in the case of Australia, across the many different groups that make up the indigenous world of, of Australia and uh, working out where in the country these suicide rates are dramatically high and where they're not. And if we, if we knew that, and there are certainly groups in, here in Australia who are trying to uh, work this out uh, to find high and low incidence communities. Um, now, uh, I, I want to say then quickly uh, something about this notion of cultural continuity and um, um, because it underpins the, the work that we've done with suicidal uh, youth, individual youth and hold, uh, hold indigenous communities. Um, now, I could go on about this, wrongly go on about it for a very long time. Um, but um, if you think about what it, it, it could possibly mean to be an individual or to uh, be a or, or for there to be uh, cultural communities, then um, there are historically two constitutive conditions that are necessary to be in place for you to be counted as a person or for your community to be uh, counted as a cultural group. Uh, one of these is that uh, everything inevitably changes. We're, we're like sh gillless sharks in a stream of continuous change. Okay? So it's just inherent in the circumstance of, of, of human existence that everything is on the move. But at the same time, it's absolutely critical for if there's to be something like a culture or something like an identifiable person, that there has to be a way of finding sameness in the face of that uh, changing difference. Okay, so change and sameness are inevitable, and the notion of, of, of continuity is a struggle to try to find uh, a way of talking about uh, sameness within change. Um, now that works itself out. Um, uh, there's a, a, a famous long dead uh, philosopher, psychologist, uh, William James, who said life is like a skiff moving through time with a bow as well as a stern. And what he uh, tried to communicate in elaborating that, that metaphor was that um, um, part of personhood and part of culture requires a backward referring gaze upon where we came from, uh, a sense of ownership of one's past and uh, looking off the bow, uh, it requires a sense of, of uh, ownership or anticipating one's own future. So selfhood and or personhood and culture um, have to proceed uh, with a look back at the one's cultural or personal past and looking forward to one's um, um, community level um, um, uh, hopes and expectations for the future. Now, 
um, maybe. so why this becomes relevant, uh, especially relevant, I think, in this kind of context, is that uh, an idea which probably everyone in the room is committed to is the idea that um, the damage done, the wounds inflicted by uh, colonization were of attack, uh, constituted an attack on both of these dimensions. That is, the past was labeled as, as inferior, childlike, um, uh, made up of um, myths and legends that don't stand up to, the, to contemporary scientific views. So uh, colonization cut off the past of uh, whole communities. And at the same time, it reached ahead uh, forward and thinking that these people whose land they were stealing um, were childlike, that they weren't uh, competent to take care of themselves. And as a result, um, uh, they had to do it for them. Uh, they had to have some parental-like parental um, control over how these communities unfolded in the future. So colonization everywhere that it's occurred has had these two elements. It truncates both the past, a connection to the past, and a connection to the future. Now, um, um, the, the work that uh, I've done in this area uh, uh, really divides into two, and I'll tell you uh, very quickly about uh, just one of them and devote most of my remarks to the other. I want to tell you a little bit about how one would attempt to, um, to measure whether an individual kid um, uh, suffered some uh, disruption to their ownership of their past or sense of control of their future. And um, we've done this with hundreds of children, uh, young people, um, both indigenous and non-indigenous. And I'll give you just one example of that at a moment. Um, and um, th this image on, uh, on the screen of Jean Valjean from Les Miserables um, is a, a stimulus material we used. We picked from what are called in, in North America uh, classic comic books. These are stories of figures of, of great books from uh, uh, the past. And the theme in many of them is that you have a person who starts off one way and then trouble happens and they end up some other way. But to understand the story, you must understand that despite the changes, we are, this is a story about one person. And um, so we, we simply read these stories to, to young people uh, and asked them um, to um, um, explain to us uh, why Jean Valjean, uh, who started off a street thief, was the one and the same individual as was Monsieur Madeleine, the pseudonym that he took when he was building hospitals and churches for the poor. Uh, we then went on to ask him about themselves. Had they changed? In what way had they changed? And we tried to press them to explain how either they felt that they were or felt that they were not continuous in time. They were one and the same person. So we've given this and other kinds of instruments that psychologists like myself are want to do um, uh, in an attempt to, to identify indi individuals who had a, um, a, 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 a strong sense or no sense of uh, themselves as uh, temporally persistent individuals. Here's one study that I'll show you 
you don't need to look at all the details of this. What we did was uh, we went to a psychiatric hospital, the huge hospital in Vancouver, Canada, um, uh, and they have an adolescent unit, and kids come in, they typically spend six weeks or so there, uh, and um, we camped at the front door, and every time a kid came in, two things happened. One is that nursing staff decided whether these with this particular child was a suicide risk. And if they thought he or she was a suicide risk, then they took away their shoelaces, their belt, their sharp pencil. Um, they were checked every 15 minutes. The things that you do if uh, you're taking responsibility to try to keep some, someone alive who seems uh, bent upon killing themselves. And then there were kids who were not judged to be suicidal. And we also went out into the community to the schools that these kids came from and found equal numbers of boys and girls of particular ages. Five minutes? Well, it says nine here. <laughs> this may be just an expression of the fact that I'm boring you, but uh, which, which is true? Is it nine minutes and 44 seconds? Nine minutes and 44 seconds. Okay, <laughs> good. <clears throat> okay, so uh, essentially what's going on in, in this graph uh, indicates that if you look at the people who had high suicide, who were judged to be suicidal, 83% uh, of them had no way of answering questions about their own personal persistence. They just drew a blank. They didn't sit there and say nothing. They had a lot of, had as much to say, but they uh, had no way uh, that, that they were, would find acceptable. So you, they might say, well, um, uh, it, my fingerprints didn't change. And I'd say, but what if I cut off your hands? Um, and um, th what did they do then? Go to some other body part, you know? Uh, and they, was, they saw the futility of that. So, but if you look at the kids who are uh, control kids, kids out in the community, not a single child came up with a no answer. They all had some way of understanding themselves as being continuous in time. Um, that was also largely true of the people who were admitted to the hospital. Um, and, um, uh, but were judged to be um, non-suicidal. But now, n knowing, having been reminded that I either have four minutes or eight minutes, um, uh, let me uh, quickly go on to the, the part of all of this, which has to do with looking at uh, continuity, cultural continuity across time. And, and its relationship to youth suicide. So picture now that you've got uh, 200 communities uh, and uh, some of them have these really high suicide rates and others have no suicides. And now you're looking for something that might account for those differences. And here are some things that uh, have occurred to some people, but they just don't work. Things like, um, the urban versus the rural kids, or kids who are in care, or the population density of the communities that they live in, or income adequacy of their families, um, the employment levels of uh, uh, their family members, uh, labor force skills, all these kinds of things that often fit into assessments of, of whole communities. None of those uh, turned out to be related to suicide levels. Here, however, is a list of things largely generated because they either refer to uh, efforts on the part of communities to reclaim ownership of their past or achieve a sense of civic control over their future. So self-government, for example, 
these, these communities once had self-government, and now they uh, proceed on the assumption that if they could scramble and get it back, uh, that would, everything would be better off. Uh, in Canada, there's a big fight about land claims and treaty rights, and communities that are involved in that are um, uh, in, in, in some way have much lower suicide rates, better educational facilities, better health services, better control of police and fire and other rural matters. Um, interestingly, um, the, just the existence of cultural facilities like a building um, um, another issue, uh, a timely one, is women in government. The, the indigenous people of Western Canada uh, were, uh, lived in a matriarchal world. But when the white guys came in, they told everyone that we only want to talk to the men. So they were disenfranchised and communities worked to get that, some of that uh, reversed. Um, Communities that control their own child protection services uh, uh, um, built upon a history of, uh, of child theft, really, and putting children in institutions. And uh, finally, uh, knowledge of indigenous languages. So for all 200 bands, we had a measure of each of those things, half of which refer to a scramble to own the future, and the other half a scramble to recoup uh, ownership of the past. Now, if you, um, here are, uh, again, I don't want you to get lost in the details of this. Uh, it just turns out that if um, uh, you don't have any of those good things going for you, uh, and, and that means the, the, everything that's in dark blue, um, uh, then your suicide rate, which is measured uh, in, in the ordinate here, um, is higher in every instance individually. Then the trick is to um, capitalize on the fact that uh, these aren't just individual items, but constitute a, uh, an ensemble of uh, efforts to measure uh, the, the notion of cultural continuity as it both reaches back into uh, the traditional past and forward into an unknown future. This is the same stuff um, uh, redone f five years later. Uh, we've, we're now on wave four. So this is wave two data. Wave three data isn't quite complete yet. Um, if I were to take one take home slide, it would be this. Uh, what it shows you is that every community that has all six of, or originally six, um, uh, factors that are determinants of suicide, um, things like running their own schools, every community that had all six of those had no suicides, and then it just climbs. And as you have fewer and fewer of those community attributes, the suicide rate goes up and becomes something like six to ten times higher than the general population. Now, um, that's just uh, another wave of data. Um, and I, I want to use what uh, my remaining uh, uh, two minutes and 20 seconds uh, to, um, uh, to say a couple of quick things uh, about the implications of this for practical matters of dealing with suicide in the present and future. Um, one is the, and I've said really enough about this, uh, this, this notion of the kind of the myth of the a monolithic indigen, a kind of like they're all the, everybody's like a pea in a pod. And you can say the same thing about every person, whatever community they're from. And um, the data in hand indicates strongly that that's just not true. And to the extent that it's not true, uh, then we're making a huge mistake uh, inventing one size fits all programs 
for a, a whole population uh, made up of radically culturally different groups. Um, the um, almost the final thing um, that I, I want to stress is that uh, picture in your mind one of these communities that has no suicides. Okay, and re remember that half of the communities have no such uh, have no suicides or haven't had one for 20 years. Uh, how do you how do you countenance that? How do you understand it? Um, and I believe we're uh, obligated to uh, understand that there must be indigenous knowledge um, insinuated into these communities that allow them to create a world uh, in which children can be raised to believe that it's better to be alive than dead. Okay? So there is knowledge that of how to accomplish that, and that's the knowledge that is evidenced by the fact that there are all these communities that have no suicides. Um, what we've got in this place is uh, a bunch of top-down strategies. Uh, in New York, um, um, uh, or in Canberra, or wherever, um, Washington, D.C., uh, groups uh, create, now I'm out of time, and so I'll, I'll just finish this with a very long sentence, if I may. Um, you've got all of these um, uh, um, assemblages, typically of accommodations, perhaps like myself, um, and uh, they hand over to policymakers um, ideas about how to have a suicide prevention, typically a one-size-fits-all suicide prevention, and they're going to parachute this into communities across the nation, and then uh, hopefully it will come somehow trickle down to the level of individual bands, tribes, mobs, whatever. Um, um, the trouble is we've been doing that for decades, and it just doesn't work. Um, what we need, in my judgment, is uh, something that is a kind of lateral transfer of knowledge that is not from the top down of some um, egghead uh, person like myself, um, but a full recognition that all of the communities that have no suicides or suicide rates at least equal to the general population they must know something. They, they may not have declarative knowledge, that is, maybe you can't just spit out an answer if asked, but there is proof on the ground that they know how to prevent suicide in those places. And the, the best way to proceed into the future, in my judgment, is not to count on the people who are parachuting things down from uh, above, but uh, working out schemes in which communities that have met with high rates of success in having lows, low or no suicides and somehow sharing uh, across communities uh, this, not, not guesswork, but real knowledge about how to prevent suicide. So I'm done. Um, I, I make you an offer. Um, if anyone would like some papers about this, um, you could email me. And uh, my email is pretty simple. It's my last name, Chandler, at mail.ubc, that's University of British Columbia, dot ca. And so mail mail me a request and I'll honor it. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>